Hey, if you are a guest, I know Rodney, welcome to you earlier if this is your first time here. Um, you're probably like a lot of us. I don't know when the first time you stepped into this room was. Jojo noted uh, as he jumped up here, you know, we don't, not everybody around the world worships with the kind of resources we have, you know, with an orchestra and a choir and all those things or, or a band and, and all of the resources, the things that we have is kind of amazing. I remember years ago when I stepped into this place, which is really unique, right? Not just in Dallas, but kind of around the world. It is a beautiful place. You step in from the back, and if you're online and you've never been here, there, Scripture across the beams that, that remind us that Scripture guides us in everything that we do. Um, we, we see the, the stained glass, the painted glass behind me. Uh, that reminds us that Jesus, you know, Christ centers us in all things. The, even the steeple that points up to the cross where thousands of people have come by every single day and see the cross. That points us to Christ and to our hope, the only hope we have of salvation. All of them serve as architectural reminders and symbols of what matters to us how Christ has provided for us, right? I'm guessing that you have some of those around in your house, maybe on your desk or maybe in your workplace, a car. Anybody have any reminders? Think about it. Scripture, maybe you have a cross hanging up on your wall at home. Anybody have something like that that just reminds you, every time you see it, reminds you of a, of a verse you love or the Lord, it reminds you, just a cross which is a symbol that reminds us of the provision he's made for us. By grace, he has offered uh, great hope for us. Well, what we're doing as we kicked off this, this new year, we're in a series of messages on the promises of God. And they really are a look at, the biblical word is covenants. We're looking at the covenants. Last week was the Adamic covenant to Adam, and we talked about this eucatastrophe, if you were here. This good catastrophe that comes out. There's a twist where we see the fall in Genesis 3, and then out of that comes this story of salvation. Even there, there's a promise that's coming because that's what God does. Covenants are different from contracts, we've noted. We'll talk about this further. It, because God keeps his side of the covenant. A covenant agreement says, I'm in regardless of whether you are or not. The closest thing we have it in, in our culture, I guess, still is marriage. It's, not, it's, 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 a, it's a contract, yes, but it's more than a contract. A contract says... If, as long as you're in, I'm in. If you're out, I am out. If you don't keep your end of the bargain, we got trouble. But with God, covenants that he makes with us, he keeps his promise. The big question remains, and we'll see it every week. We'll see it today. How is it that we make this covenant agreement with God, he makes it with us, we enter into that with him, we don't keep our side of the covenant. But he does. How does he pull this off? And we're going to see again today how it happens. Today we're going to talk about, it is the promise of restraint, but I think more rightly, it's the promise of provision. We're going to look at a story where you're going to be reminded of a symbol, one of the greatest images, symbols, that God himself has given to us, his handiwork, his artwork, that reminds us of his great love for us. Now we're going to look at Genesis chapter 8. I want all of you to turn in your Bible there. Genesis 8. You have your dwell reading um, journal that uh, we've noted earlier. I hope you have yours. There's a place in here on Sundays. Uh, a place in Saturday, yesterday, I'm in it re reading and praying um, and going back over the week. Uh, there's an opportunity for that. And then on Sunday, there's a place for you to, to take notes on sermons. So our great hope is that all of us carrying our Bibles and our dwell reading uh, plan, our journals with us. This is our new edition for you because we're serious about God's word. If you're a member of our church, guest, you can join us. But if you're a member, you're reading the word every day. And you've already read this passage long before we got here. Um, some years ago, many of you know, many years ago now, when Stacy and I first had children, we had twins. Um, our twins came, our girls came along. And uh, we thought it'd be really great to, um, you know, because they came two by two, that we would have this Noah, you know, uh, theme uh, in, our, in our nursery. So uh, I painted this rainbow uh, from crib to crib on the wall that went from one crib to another. And we had stuffed animals all around. We just thought this is a great, great thing. Um, I also put uh, a sign on the door that, that is out of 1 uh, Corinthians, talking about scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. And it says this, it says, um, 
we, we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And so I thought that was appropriate and, and serve prophetic. They're mostly changed right on time. Um, but all that to say, when we think of, of Noah and the flood, right? What do you think of? What are the things that come to mind? We think, well, we think of Noah, little, little Noah's obedient. He's the only one out of all of them that's obedient. And sure enough, he's described as a man who will do whatever God tells him to do. That's how he's described twice in the story. And, um, but we think of the animals. It's so sweet, little animals getting on the ark. We think of the rainbow. It's so beautiful. This story is terrifying, right? I mean, it's why we're singing, Lord, have mercy on us. Because this story is about God's wrath and reaction to sin. That's what it is. This is not a children's nursery rhyme. This is not just the kind of story that you read and go, this is, now, yes, it's glorious and wonderful. But if we don't see the dark side of the story, we don't understand what's really going on here. And you're going to see, uh, my hope and prayer here today is that anyone who doesn't know Jesus will come to Christ today. Because there is judgment that's coming to every person who is outside of Christ. But those who, of us who are in Christ, we're protected from the wrath that is to come to us. The justice, the judgment that comes to us because of our seeking to justify ourselves and validate our own lives before a holy God. Today is a day of great hope. This passage is powerful. As always, I want to put it in context. So in chapter three, you read this week, um, after, the, after the fall takes place, so there's uh, creation, right? And then Adam and Eve, they, 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 they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. Now this is, there's the tree of life. He said, drink, from, you know, eat from that, all the other trees. In order to get to the tree of life, they go past the tree of good and bad. This tree represents us usurping God's authority and deciding in our own eyes, we will decide what's good and bad. And we see what happens when humans, we see it today, do we not? When we disregard God's word and say, we'll figure out what's right or wrong. We'll figure that out. And without, without an outside authority, it's anybody's game. And then we see the destruction, the usurping of God's authority. And we see right away, we see the first homicide. Cain kills Abel. And in Genesis 6, I told you to turn to 8. But looking back at 6, verse 5, it says this. You can see it here. The Lord saw the wickedness. This is the description of the world right here. Wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, some of you say this sounds like the world today. But think about this. Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only, only evil continually this is the world following the fall then uh in verse 11 it's described the specific sin don't miss this is violence that's the specific sin coming after others who've been created in the image of god we're going to see this as essential in the noahic covenant so before uh the rains even begin god says in verse 18 i'll establish my covenant with you and so with all the questions that arise out of this story, and there are a lot of them that do, the Noahic covenant helps us make sense of all of this. And my hope for you is that you will leave today encouraged, uh, that you'll be reminded of the great salvation that has come to us in Christ, and that you will never, ever look at a rainbow in the same way again. Because this covenant will, will remind us here it is. If you're taking notes here, God promises to provide for our needs. That's the first thing I'm going to look at. Secondly, he promises to provide justice and he promises to provide peace. So first for our needs, look at verse 20, the waters subside. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now this sounds strange to us. We don't we don't make burnt offerings, but this is an act of worship. Okay, don't miss this. He's marking the spot where he's going to step off the boat, right? He's stepping off onto safe ground. So consider this. He is in awe of God, not just how terrifying and how dangerous God is. He's holy. He just did this 
but he has saved me and protected me. He steps out, and this is an act of contrition. I mean, Lord, have mercy on me and my family. See, we talked about this at our pastor study on Wednesday night. Had a big crowd. You can come and join us, open to everybody. We're using the dwell readings to to help us leap into how we can faithfully read God's word. Because all of us need to learn how to faithfully read God's word. And we're going to that. We talked about the meta narrative that we see throughout scripture. If I were to ask you, what's the meta narrative of scripture? The big story. And it's this creation, right? The fall, redemption, and restoration. That's, those are the core four you know, phases of the redemptive story. And what we see here is creation, yes. Watch this. Well, here, here's the point. We said the meta narrative focused in on particular stories and in scripture it helps us to interpret the Bible. And we see it here. Do you not? We see creation. We see the fall. We see that, watch this, the ark becomes this vessel, okay, of deliverance, of salvation for Noah, and he steps on dry ground, and we're going to see now the restoration of things, but this only points to the greater narrative, an ultimate restoration to come, and ultimate redemption to come in another, not an ark, but the vessel of God's Redemption coming to us in Jesus. Look at verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, again, this is strange language for us. This is anthropological language that helps us understand God, who is spirit. Um, and, it, and it says that he smells this aroma. The Lord said to his, uh, in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So this, this idea of original sin. This literally means, this is interesting, it's a tranquilizing odor. Now I know that, again, sounds a bit strange, but this, the offering, watch this, his praise and contrition, his worship of God, soothes the heart of God, calms the wrath of God before Noah. Noah serves as a priest A priest is a bridge between man and God. He's serving as a priest, not only for himself, but for his family and for all of creation at this point. So here's here's a challenge for all of us. His humility and his gratitude to God is bridging a gap for himself and others. Now, this is true for all of us. We are Christians, ambassadors in the world, and we serve as priests in the world, bridging the gap for others. In our prayers, in our lives, everything we do. And if you're a parent, watch this. If you're a grandparent, this is, this is true for all of us, but particularly if you're a parent, you serve in a priestly role between your family, your children, and God Almighty. As you, as you determine peace before God, confessing your sin, worshiping him, you are, watch this, Noah literally saves his life and his family's life. You are literally saving the spiritual life of your family as you walk with God. Noah's obedience and yours impacts your family directly. And we see it here. Your obedience brings life or it brings death. And there are those who did not survive, but our priestly actions on behalf of others point them to God. Look at, look at how it continues on, verse 21. Neither. Will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done? While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. We sang about it earlier. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest. This is essential to the Noahic covenant. Listen to this. This is so important. And this is a good day to talk about this. God is saying not only will he never destroy the earth like this again, but the natural cycles, okay, the patterns and seasons of life will not be stopped. They will continue on. And and what he's saying is here, the earth will always remain a habitable place to be for all of his creation. Now you stepped outside today and said, I can't survive out here very long, right? Um, Or off in July somewhere, we're longing for cold to come. But this is the point. Are there cataclysmic things that take place in the world? Yes. Are there times when people seem to live in a place that is completely decimated? Is there global suffering in the world? Yes. But God is saying, 
I, I will establish patterns in this world and I will provide for you. But what's going on here, watch this. This is so important, I think, to understand. He's also saying, he's, he's providing for our needs and in so doing so, he provides uh, for us security and order in the world. This is so important. Um, without God sustaining life and guiding us, cre- guiding creation, we have no order. We see it in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, there's chaos that covers the waters. The, the waters represent chaos in the world. God comes along and he brings, it says his, his spirit hovers over the waters and he brings peace, he brings order, and he establishes boundaries for the water. So what it's saying is God brings peace, patterns, and order into our lives. He does this from a, from a macro level, but he does it on the micro level. From the macro level, it's why we often talk about, and, and scientists, even non-believers, I suppose, capture this and understand there's an intelligent design behind all of creation. It's one of that we talk about cause and effect, which is the simple argument for the existence of God and all that exists, but there's intelligent design. That's the great evidence for the existence of God. Think about it. Salmon swim upstream the same rivers every year. We see monarch butterflies migrate. Flowers bud in the springtime. Leaves fall in the autumn. The cold comes every now and then here in Dallas. But we know warm weather is coming. How is it that farmers would be able to even provide food that you ate without even thinking about it this week if it weren't for patterns in the world? You see how God cares for us in ways we don't even understand. How is it that my friend Pete Delkis could tell us what's up with the weather? Because he he knows through patterns that God has taught us. God promises to provide for our needs, but it's also a promise to bring order into chaos. But he wants to do this in your life as well. And he does it through one man, again, who's described as doing whatever God told him to do. Order comes in your life when you obey God. Disobedience to God brings disorder into your life and people around you. This is why uh, we all know this. When you go to places where God's laws, at least Judeo-Christian biblical law and order exists, then people flourish. When you live in places, as even as we've heard today, places where there's a lack of perhaps food. I've been to to the slums uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. I've been to the poorest places in Africa. I've been to the most troubled places in the world. Some of you have been to war-torn areas of the world. They are brutal places to live because when your basic needs are not met, chaos reigns. This is why so many of our partners in the Caribbean, many of our pastors, they say, we need food for our families. Because without food, you see, we can't do anything that we do. But we don't have to go to these places in the world. You don't have to go to southern Sudan. You you can go to the the homeless population in, in Dallas. You can go to food deserts in South Dallas. You can go to places where we are serving homeless people at Cornerstone. And places in the East, East Dallas, West Dallas, all around where we are serving others, even children. Texas has the highest percentage of food insecurity among children than any state in the nation. That should not be. Not with those of us who have so much. So we are leveraging all that we have to help serve the greatest needs among us. And as noted, when you give, your giving goes to help make this happen. But here's the thing, most of us didn't lack food and water today. In fact, I'm probably reminding you of how grateful we should be. But surely you've pondered, why is it that me, those of us who have so much, why is it that we're rarely satisfied? Because we have greater needs, don't we? You see, not only does God bring, meet our our needs, provide for our needs on the macro level, praise be to God, that we take for granted. He provides for our personal needs. George Bernard Shaw said this, there are two tragedies in life. One is to lose your heart's desire. The other is to gain it. See, in our culture, here's what happens. Many of us are on the run. We are racing 
to pursue the thing that we believe will finally fulfill us. Many of us are killing ourselves. The saddest day in your life is when you work so hard and give up everything you've got, and many have given up everything. Families, relationships, all things, only to find that you're still empty. Because your greatest needs are met only by the Creator. It's only Him. He alone can satisfy the human heart. See, what you need more today than anything, the greatest need that you have is the need for peace. You need order within. If you don't have order within, you're going to be chasing after something outside of God and you'll never find it. We'll talk about that in a moment. First, God provides for our needs. Look at this. He provides, he will provide justice. God promises to provide justice. This is so important. Remember, the main sin here is namely violence and injustice that's brought to others who are, repeating theme, created in his image. Look at this in verse one of chapter nine. Here's the Noahic covenant. God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Where have you heard that before? That's the creation story. That's Genesis 1, 28. You notice this is a restart. That's the cultural mandate. This is a, this is a reset, okay? And so it says in verse, this is an act of mercy is what this is. Verse two, the fear of, God, of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. What's going on here? And upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. God is gifting now mankind. After all that we've done, he now gifts us. God establishes, look at this, a healthy fear for animals, okay, that serve two purposes. One, because humans are going to start to prey on animals now. So they're fearful. There's, an, there's this intuitive kind of fear, but also respect. It's why we could take a mighty horse and tame it to be used for good purpose, where otherwise the horse could destroy all of us, but it could do good things. Look at verse three. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. Sounds like a prohibition, if there was, on eating uh, animals. Now is lifted, uh, but, but the world that, Adam's, uh, that Noah's entering into, he, he may be a new Adam in, in sorts, but this is a new world that now he's stepping into. It's fallen. There are new rules at play here. So he's no longer in Eden. So look at verse four. But you shall not eat flesh with its life that is blo its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require reckoning. Notice the wording here, reckoning. For every beast, I will require, key word, it from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life. Now there's a lot we could say here, a lot of details here. The blood, bottom line, the bloodline is is precious the lifeblood is the source of all of life so when there's bloodshed when one is murdered there's a reckoning this reckoning is is a unique word it's an inquiring it's an accounting it, it's the, it, god will take into detail every injustice and every every wrong that is done against one who's created in his image there's no person on the planet more important than any other single person on the planet regardless of where you're from what you have we tend to set up those kind of parameters regardless of the color of your skin your education what he's saying is here that, that there's going to be a reckoning for every injustice that's done in the world the scales of justice will play out across the world and when you don't see it happening you watch the news or whatever you don't see it in your own personal life god promises i promise there will be justice. And this is a great point to pause and talk about the primary command here. Don't murder. Don't murder. Now, most of us here, we're, I'm not going to murder. This is not a sin that I'm really tempted with, um, except when you, lose your, you know, lo when you lose your temper, right? Jesus has a word about that. And, 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 and we'll see that in a moment. But, but here, here's what I want to say. I've taught this before. This is so, so helpful has been helpful for me. As a parent, this has been helpful. And it's this. For every negative command God gives us, play this out throughout all the Ten Commandments. 
This is a great word. And grandparents, teach your kids. That if, you, if your kids aren't teaching your grandkids, you can teach them. And it's this. Watch this. For every negative command, don't do this. There are two positive reasons behind every negative command. To protect and provide. Protection, provision. Thou shalt not murder. Why? Protect us from being murdered. Live a life of safety. Okay? Provide something better. Peace. Love and flourishing life. You see? And that can play out in every... Don't have sex outside of marriage. I mean, we go a lot of different directions. Why not? Protect us and provide for us. You can play that out in your own mind, right? So he says, I'm going to require of you if blood is taken, then blood will be shed. If a life is taken, then a life will be taken. Now, we'll, we'll play out that here in a moment to, to get underneath that a little bit. But th- what is required of us? Let's, let's be practical. What is, what is required of us who maybe, maybe haven't, I haven't killed, I'm not going to kill anyone. What's required of us? Well, Micah 6, 8 tells us what's required of us. And what's required of us is to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly before your God. This summarizes the, the challenge out of the Noahic covenant. Every person is created in the image of God. So an attack on any single person is an attack on God himself. This is why we bring justice into the world. Many years ago, um, and it's on this weekend that I read Dr. King's um, letter from a Birmingham jail because I discovered many years ago that he was actually calling out white clergy like me who are unwilling to get into the fray because there's no way it's going to happen apart from all people coming together to bring about justice for all. And in the letter, he writes this, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is at the heart of the Noahic covenant. This is, this is Genesis 9. He says this, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. That's exactly what's going on here. That he's articulated in this little letter written on a newspaper, margins, from jail. But look at this. Let's keep going. Verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of, of, of a man, okay, by man his blood shall be shed. For God made, his, made man in his own image, and you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply it. Now, justice is a constant theme in God's work because he's a God who is, he is just, all right? Now, we can debate all day, and I don't have time to dive deeper into this. We can debate all day whether the death penalty is an effective deterrent to crime. But that's not really the point here. Because remember, um, the, there were not established really rules and, and, and order at this point, at least not, not provisions, or, you know, fines and imprisonment. The goal here, the point here is justice. Say what you will about a life taken for another life. It's just, right? G.K. Chesterton, the English philosopher, theologian, he, he wrote this. Listen to this. For children are innocent and love justice. While most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. Think about it. Go among children, those of you who serve with children. He took my cookie. Well, what should we do about that? I should get his cookie. That's just. You're right. You see, we, we complicate it, don't we? Now, others, and we had time, others argue that, that everyone created the image of God, then, then even the state can't take a life, all those things, and has the the, the way of Jesus now change the trajectory of it all. That's not really the point here. But I know this. If we were on de- death row, if you and I were on death row, if I was on death row, I would be saying, Lord, have mercy. Is there a way out? And yet Jesus tells us in Matthew 5 that any of us, we might say, don't murder but, but even those who fall short of murder were angry towards a brother. Their hearts towards another are liable. And he even goes on to say, if you even say, you fool, you come at another. Like you're less than me. You're not creating an image of God in essence. 
You're, you're liable to hell, the hell of fire. So, so what's going on here? The Sermon on the Mount says, every person created in the image of God, and when we come against them, then we too are liable. That we too deserve punishment. So what do we do about this? None of us can live like this. And this is where the Noahic covenant ends. It, it starts to show us that there's a way out. You see, there are no scales of justice, friends, before a holy God. You can't say, well, I've, been, I've done this. Not before God Almighty. We are in trouble. So how can God keep his part of the covenant while well, we do not? Well, the Bible says in Romans 3 that there's, there's a righteousness, there's a rightness before God that has come apart from the law. Praise be to God. In Romans 3, 26, it says, it was shown, it was to show us his righteousness. You see, at the present time in Christ, so that he might be just and the justifier and the one who has faith, for the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, see what it, what it is, Christ becomes the one who justifies. He becomes the judge and the one who provides. He provides for our needs. He provides justice, praise be to God. And I'll close with this, he provides peace. He promises to provide peace. Look at verse uh, eight. Now we come to the great, the bow in the sky. Look at this. Then God said to Noah, and his sons with him. Behold, I establish my covenant for you, with you and with your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast on the earth. Look at this. This is a covenant for every person. I, I didn't think about this till this week. There, there's, a, there's a sense. Could it be that this covenant, that even the animals are aware that's what's going on here there's a covenant that i've made i i, I can sit haven't birds haven't animals seen rainbows in the sky before could it be that in this sense of their creation and rightness with god look at verse 11 i establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth and god said this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. God is the initiator. He makes a perpetual pact. Notice this is everlasting, okay? On and on, verse 13. I have set a bow in the cloud and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And then look at verse 14. When I bring clouds, I want you to see some of the details here. When I, when I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of, the, uh, of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Verse 16. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, as a, uh, it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Okay, friends, as we close, I want you to consider the rainbow. Consider the bow. God hangs his bow in the clouds. This is literally a bow, a weapon of war. The bow being hung with the, with the string at the bottom the wood at the top, just like a rainbow? Consider this, God has set his bow aside. And when you have a bow that is pointed upward, where is the arrow pointing? The arrow is not pointing down to earth. The arrow is pointing up into the heavens. God placed his bow up in the sky. He hung his bow as a reminder that his wrath is not coming to us, that his covenant that's made here is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, the arrow of his wrath will no longer come to us, but instead, while we were yet sinners, Christ came, died for us, took on the bow, went to the cross, took on the spear. The wrath of God was taken upon Christ so that it would not come to you and to me. We had no way out, but his covenant is, is, is held true. And, and where the rain and the storm collide and hit the light 
is where God's wrath, his holiness, and his grace collide on the cross and redemption is made possible for us. The arrow goes into the very heart of God so that you and I will forever remember what he says in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now, everybody say now, now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Praise be to God. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the beauty of the rainbow that reveals to us again your great love for us. Lord, I pray that we'll never, ever see the rainbow the same again. That it will excite not only our eyes as we see the beauty of it, but that it will excite our hearts. And we will praise you that you've decided that we are, we are enough, that, that we, we, we are loved by you. And that the wrath that should have come to us in our sin is taken upon our Savior. So we praise you. Lord, I pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you. Oh, may it be today. Friend, turn your heart to Jesus. Let him save you from your sin. There's coming a day. And it won't be the rain of water. Revelation says that it'll be the rain of fire and judgment that comes upon those who have sought to discover, find their own salvation and their own good works. Turn to him. Lord, we love you and I pray that we will be agents of justice in this world as we live for you in the redemptive arc of all history that points to the cross. We love you and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen.